We are talking about HIV treatment and prevention for women here today at IAS 2019 in Mexico City. I'm here with Dr. Carl Diefenbach. Carl, thanks it's for joining me. It's a pleasure me. to be here. And today is the last day of the conference. So this is a very important day for us to talk about treatment, prevention, and the impact that we will ultimately be able to have on women with all the advances that we're making. And we would love to take your comments during the broadcast, answer any questions you might have, or just share where you're watching from. So Carl, tell us a little bit about what we heard on the treatment front here at the conference. There were several studies. There has been a lot of new treatment information that has been presented at this meeting so far. Um, and it is all focused on continued improvement in the fixed dose combinations or the one pill once a day strategies that are dominating uh, the treatment landscape. So what we've heard are better combinations of the medications coming together and being tested head to head, looking at all types of side effects, as well as then the durability of these treatments. And we're, we're, what we're seeking is to get to a point where we have the fewest drugs in the combination with the most impact, because you want to maintain the, the, the bang for the buck with the treatment as safe as possible and maintain the highest level of virus suppression. So we've had a lot of different combinations evaluated. There, there are slight differences among them, and so this gives patients more choice, which also is one of the major themes of our meeting. And scientists have been working very hard to find long-acting forms of treatment. Where are we on that? When could we see something on the market? That's an important next step. So. As we look at the evolution of therapy, we've gone from many pills um, a day to one pill once a day. But there's going to be an intermediate step now where over the next couple of years, we'll start seeing therapeutic options that will go maybe weekly and then ultimately maybe monthly. But long term, I think we'll get to a point where we're having an injectables and implantables that will last six months or a year for therapy. And that all of these will be game changing events and we'll have to deal uh, with how they are rolled out, how they're implemented, and how we talk to community about what this means for them um, with their treatment options. Great. And so switching gears a little bit, I want to talk about young women and girls in Southern Africa. Why is this an important population to talk about? So as we heard yesterday at the POPAR meeting, this is a group that um, is in many ways at the center of the epidemic. They are the most vulnerable because between the ages of 18 and 24, they become infected at such a high rate. The, the incidence that we're seeing in this population across Sub-Saharan Africa approaches 6% annually, which is the most heartbreaking number. Uh, and so what we need are prevention options that will work for this population as we go forward. It's really a challenge. And so speaking of prevention options, we heard results uh, presented here from HPTN 082. Tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, let's talk about HPTN 082. This was a, an attempt to see how we could implement pre-exposure prophylaxis in this population. And the good news is, um, with education and with um, the ability to talk to investigators, this population had high uptake of pre-exposure prophylaxis to the point of over right around 90% of the people that were offered PrEP actually began PrEP. The good news from that was that a large percentage of those actually came back to their first 30-day visit to get another batch of, of PrEP. Long term, though, the results are, are somewhat disappointing or and represent a major challenge we're facing. That by the end of the study, only 9% of the, of the originally enrolled cohort was, uh, had evidence of adherence to the, um, to the regimen. That really shows that we have a significant challenge making PrEP work in this population. So what are the implications? What does that mean? What do we need to do? Well, I think what we need to do is understand what, um, how pre-exposure prophylaxis or other strategies could help this population um, stay adherent to um, a prevention regimen as well as make it accessible to them so they weren't feeling the stigma, the stigmatization associated with, with pills. We just don't know what that is. But maybe we should talk a little bit about the ring because I think that that was some other very important data that we saw um, at this meeting. And what we, uh, what we heard from Jared Baden um, of the Icogosite Trials Network 
was the output of their open label extension study. What's an open label extension study? The so that uh, so an open label extension study is when you take a group. In this case, we took all participants in, who had successfully completed the Aspire trial and decided it was really important to ask some very fundamental, real-world questions with that population. Now, specifically, we wanted to know, if you were included in a study, would you be willing to access the ring? And if you did, how well did you use it over a year period? And so everybody who completed the study was invited back. They could declare up front that they either didn't want to participate in the study, or they wanted to participate in the study but didn't want to access the ring, or they could start accessing the ring, and any of those things in between, they could change their mind. A lot of choice. Study. A lot of choice. And I think that was a very important part of the design. What we saw from this study was that approximately 90% of all the rings that were distributed to the women had evidence of use. And I think I, the wording on that has to be critically understood. It's not that women use the rings 90% of the time. It's that the rings had evidence of use in terms of 90% of the actual um, ring devices. The data is not yet available on actual correlation of an individual woman with her collection of rings over the course of the study. Uh, that is still to come. But it does look like an increase in adherence from the prior study. It did. It did. It showed an increase in adherence. And uh, because this was an open label extension study, there was no predefined uh, actual functional cohort that was a control group. What Jared and the team did is build what we would call a synthetic cohort uh, based on modeling data of what a a, an unexposed or a placebo group would look like. And to so try they, to figure out, to try to figure how out well it worked. The, the, the relative incidence. So you measure uh, an incidence rate in the actual hope population. What would be the an incidence rate that is predicted would be of a control group. So taking those two numbers, what we saw was the prediction was that overall there was a 39% uh, incidence, a uh, reduction in incidence rate in the people using the ranks, which is better than the 31% uh, efficacy that we were seeing in uh, the uh, Aspire trial originally. It's not a big jump, but it was still a jump. And so I think there's some additional work that needs to be done here to understand and unpack what was happening uh, in Aspire. So with that, we have pretty much completed the bulk of the analysis of efficacy uh, coming out of, of Aspire and Hope. So this closes one chapter in the ring. And now we are waiting to hear from the EMA about uh, the readout of whether the ring um, will be licensed. And that is to come uh, later this year or early next. Great. And so in terms of Aspire and Hope and OE2, those are all studies that were conducted in Southern Africa. What is what can we learn that affects people in the United States, young folks in the United States, from those studies? Can we draw any parallels, or does it inform the science that helps people in the U.S. as well? It absolutely does, because I, I, I think the idea that um, young people are more similar globally than different, um, it, it points to the challenge uh, that we have in any young population is how to encourage that population to access health care, to acknowledge that they may need some assistance, um, stay, being able to love as they wish and still say HIV free. I, I think it really is important for us to think about the messaging that can be used, whether it's in Sub-Saharan Africa, New York City, San Francisco, Oakland, um, the, the rural South, you know, outside of Birmingham, you name it. it people are people. And I think um, teenagers are teenagers. So I think it's just important to, to realize that this population has special concerns and needs that we have to be able to address. Great. And Carl, what are your key takeaways from this meeting? So this was, so every so often there are IAS meetings that occur 
that ultimately become landmark events. And I think that this will be this will go down in history as a, one of those landmark meetings where the, the message of choice and the emergence of the range of choices that are available now for prevention and on the horizon for prevention were first delineated. So what we had, what we heard at this meeting, let's just review. We heard the launch of Mosaico, an efficacy trial for a vaccine that may be, if effective, a global vaccine. We heard the uh, information about TAF, which has pretty profound pharmacology in men. No data yet on women, and that is a major gap that needs to be filled That's the quickly. daily pill. That's a daily pill. But maybe that'll be better than Truvada. But again, there's a tremendous gap in our knowledge there that needs to be filled quickly. We heard about a slap the beer. Slap to beer. Yeah, slap to beer. Or MK8591. <laughs> it's still easier to say MK8591 or EFDA. Um, about a... Um, an implantable rod that could last up to a year or longer. Uh, so those are the kinds of prevention strategies that give not just women and not just men, but all people choice eventually for what would be available for them for prevention. So we'd have daily pills, pills on demand, implantables, injectables like cabotegravir, possibly a ring, rectal douches, all options okay. and ultimately a safe and effective and durable HIV vaccine. That's on the prevention front. On the treatment front, medication continues to get better and safer and easier to access. So these are the takeaway messages from this meeting. Great. And what can people look forward to over the next year till we're back at an IAS convention? Well, over the next year, many of these studies will start. Mosaic trial will start. There's a high probability we'll hear results from AMP, the monoclonal antibody study. And we will also hear about the ring. So a lot of good stuff to come. Carl, thank you for joining me this week. Thank you for joining us, most of all. For more information, please visit HIV.gov.